Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back again to the Design on Cloud Pavilion, which has been sponsored by Google Cloud and Microsoft. So glad to see so many people uh, out there today. Quick reminder, uh, from 5 to 6 tonight, we're going to have a beer and wine mixer right around here by the alley. So uh, if you're interested in grabbing a free drink at the end of the day, that's a great way to do it. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get out of your way real quick, and uh, let's go ahead and have a a nice warm welcome for uh, our next cloud panel. All right. Afternoon, everyone. Yeah. Thanks so much for taking the time. I think this is it's my 15th DAC, and it's, it's definitely the DAC of cloud. I mean, this is... Uh, so there's a couple of panels. This is a, a chance again we, uh, for us to do this. So my name's Paul Cunningham. Uh, I run the verification group at uh, Cadence Design Systems. Uh, so very privileged to get the chance to host this panel here. I have five distinguished panelists uh, with me here today. In, in no particular order, just because so we, have, we have Ron Moore uh, here, who's Vice President Business Planning and Product Devil- Delivery for ARM's physical design team. Uh, we have Derek Chu, who is the Group Hardware Engineering Manager leading Microsoft Azure's FPGA cloud ecosystem. Uh, we have uh, Ronnie Wang, co-founder and CTO of CNEX, very exciting uh, company driving the, so he drives the company's advanced SSD controller architecture. Um, and then we have uh, Cyrus Ziai here. Uh, I cannot say too much. He is uh, Vice President Engineering of a stealth mode startup, but in the quantum computing space, so very excited. Hope you can say a few words, at least, on the panel. Cyrus. And then lastly, Carl from, from our very own Cadence here. So, so Carl is Vice President IT at Cadence. So he actually manages... Uh, and leads our infrastructure programs that, that deliver Cadence products on the cloud, and then also actually uh, our Cadence uh, internal engineering teams. So, for example, my own team's use of the cloud for the development of our products. So thank you all guys for, for taking the time out and being with us here today. So um, the, the specific uh, theme of the, the, the panel today, it's, it's nicely up there in front of you. So, you know, EDA in the cloud, right? Are we, are we ready? Um, so I think that... Uh, I guess that also implies, you know, is there an opportunity for, for EDA in the cloud, and, and if so, where uh, and, and why? So I thought maybe, maybe we would just start, let, let each of the panelists here just say a few words about the opening question of this, of this panel, and then we'll kind of break into some more detailed questions. So, Ron, do you want to kick us off? Okay. Uh, yes, at ARM, we do feel there's an opportunity for EDA in the cloud. Uh, you know, we've started our own projects just to make sure, you know, we, we first started with delivering. In the physical IP standpoint, you know, you've got all the variation formats, very large data sets that have to go out in, into the customers and to be used and consumed. Then you talk about the characterization of memories, the characterization of standard cells. That's a very compute intensive. And for us to have that, uh, that capability in-house is very expensive. So uh, we've been working with Cadence to uh, try to make sure that their simulators are all cloud enabled and making sure that, uh, that we can get that characterization done in the cloud. So uh, how many of you actually have done design, re- done, used EDA tools? Most of you probably. How many of you have waited in a queue for your job to run? All right. So this is fundamentally a problem that cloud uh, it can tackle. We can give you virtually unlimited queues. Of course, you've got to ask your manager about budget. But fundamentally, rather than having a certain number of machines and a certain number of licenses to run on those machines, we can provide you with the ability to expand when you need to and contract when you don't. And so I think we are, there, there are very clear opportunities in the cloud. I think that the machines are there, the, the infrastructure is there. I think the biggest key that, uh, that we need to, the biggest issue we need to solve is licensing. Hello. Yeah, so um, we actually uh, started uh, um, our company five years ago, and uh, we just start. Uh, using the Cadence um, um, HDS uh, VCAD system uh, with cloud computing, and uh, we found it uh, really convenient um, and uh, easy to um, deploy and manage. And uh, we actually um, don't have our own like the um, you know VCAD uh, manager uh, management crew, and we just 
rely on the cadence to help us to uh, run the infrastructure and uh, and also it's very good um, for our multi-site kind of development uh, because we have uh, office uh, in Asia uh, and we can tap into you know the cadence um, uh, in Shanghai you know VCAT center and so far it works out quite well and now I think it's uh, um, the time also to leverage um, like a hyperscale data center to further uh, get a more computing facility for that, yeah. Uh, when, when I joined the company, I was the first non-founding employee. We made a decision actually not to buy any servers in the company at all, up to about 100 people, and then try the cloud-based solution. And so far, it's worked very well. Uh, we uh, do all kinds of different CAD, including multi-physics and things that are typically lower level than what the, the regular silicon industry is used to. And we can spin up, you know, 40, 50 machines. We've done that many, many times to get peak throughputs. And we work with many, many different CAD companies. And all the tools so far have been working reasonably well on the cloud-based infrastructure. So, so far, we're, we're happy. And we're going to try it out for a little bit longer and then figure out whether we have a balance of in-house and peak usage on the cloud or whether we stay uh, fully on the cloud. I wish I had that uh, issue, Cirrus. I wish I, I could ban all computers from our data centers. I think the opportunity for EDA is, is right now. Um, to Derek's point, uh, just waiting in a queue, waiting for servers, storage, networking resources, that seems to be a burden for a lot of companies. When you have an engineer sitting idle and the engineer says to his manager, I can't, I can't get to that critical tape out because I can't get access to a, an Intel-based computer, you know, to, to upper management, I don't think that that excuse holds, holds much ground. So I think the, as the designs get more complex, as data explodes, people need to look for alternative solutions, and I think cloud is that solution. It may not be the only solution, but it's definitely one solution in the toolbox of really any company that's looking to expand their, their resources uh, from their traditional data centers. Thank you. So I think there was some, you know, a couple of comments there about uh, you know the waiting for waiting for machines, right, and the, the sort of the available resource. Now, I mean, how much of that do you, do you think is uh, you know, because of the fact that we don't have cloud, or because it's more of a financial or a budget thing that you know if you're are you waiting for machines because the money isn't there to fund those machines, or is it is it so you know if we are in the cloud, does that mean that we can spend more money on this this service? Maybe that comes back to this business model side. Um, does anyone want to try to clarify that, comment on that? Can, uh, yeah, I just think it's a peak and valley issue. I, I don't think okay. any, any human can accurately predict the exact amount of tools or compute that they're going to need at the right time. So when you have a fixed data center with fixed resources, you're riding that wave constantly, and you're fighting other groups, you're fighting budgets. Right. So when you have cloud, you have the, in, the ability to provision uh, servers within minutes, it takes the need to plan so far ahead of way, away and says, all right, I know what my price is going to be. I can plan within you know, days or weeks or months to get my resources. And uh, that seems to be a benefit for, for a lot of companies. Yeah, let me you know, kind of use Carl as my IT guy and I'll, I'll kind of bounce off because here's the scenario that happened to us is we were at 25,000 slots you know, with the variation format at, uh, at seven nanometer, we had to go right. to 30,000 slots. So we went to Carl and we said, Carl, give us 5,000 more slots. He says, okay, you got to go through the budget cycle. And then we went through the budget cycle and then he said, okay, we can order them. Then you've got to wait for them to be delivered and set up and everything. By that time, my requirement was 35,000 slots. So what if Carl just would have said, 5,000 slots, go grab them. You're there and in the cloud. Right. No. And oh, by the way, the scale that's in the cloud is a lot cheaper than what Carl can deliver. From a from a per unit hour slot, so Do I, time to market's worth something. I think that's a that's right, the key. Right. What's your experience, Ronnie and Cyrus? Yeah, I, I think it's the flexibility part. You know, we can add more computing facility, add more storage capacity uh, when we need it. Like it's much easier than you know we just purchase in front and try to do our own. Right. And it's also the shareability, you know, that, yeah, like. 
I think the, the business model with, uh, of the CAD companies has to change as does the migration to the cloud and all the security and everything else that has to go with it. Because really, as an as a engineering manager, what you want is you want to be able, without having to plan exceptionally accurately, to say, okay, I need 1,000 licenses of this today, and I need you know 300 licenses of that tomorrow, and 400 of something else. And you should have, ideally, I guess the, the dream for a, an engineering manager is not to have friction either on the commercial side or the IT infrastructure side. So if I need to run a thousand VCS licenses, I run a thousand VCS licenses, or I guess very long, and NC or uh, whatever the appropriate uh, simulation tool is. So I want to ideally have that. That's the holy grail that I think the CAD companies and the infrastructure should strive to reach, which is eliminate all friction vis-a-vis -vis the number of CAD tools that you can spin up at any moment in time. Got it. So this idea, this notion that, that resources is infinite and immediate uh, at your fingertips, that gives you kind of a degree of freedom that just does not exist without the cloud. Um, do you think, have you, have you experienced, I mean, um, you, that, that has actually changed your use patterns, you know, that, that, that you can actually then approach design and back to the productivity, that you can go, go, where, no, go where no EDA tool has gone before, as it were. Any kind of case studies or yeah. examples of that? Well, know? definitely, we have, uh, uh, so far, you know, we have done like a three tape outs. Um, and uh, just before, right before the tape out, you know, we have a lot of uh, needs, bursty need, basically. We, we have to run through a lot of uh, um, simulation cases. In that case, we actually can request, you know, certain um, co additional computing right. licenses to be added to the, you know, um, our platform. So. It definitely helps. Definitely helps, yeah. Any, um, I mean, we talked about, uh, we can come a little bit more later, so there's the, there's the business model barrier. I think, Cyrus, you mentioned a little bit potentially about security. So maybe just as a more open thing, so what, what are the barriers here, the key barriers, where are we at in terms of kind of knocking them down? I can I can speak to, to what I encountered when when I first started talking to our own internal groups or to customers and partners. The first concern with security um, pretty much came up over and over again, and uh, conversation started all the way back in uh, 2012 between the cloud providers and customers, and maybe even prior to that. But I think that's when critical mass started building. Uh, a lot of the concerns were: Is my IP going to be safe in a cloud provider? And over the years, the cloud providers have hired vertical specialists. They have uh, certifications that most, most Fortune 100 companies don't have in their data centers because they invest a tremendous amount of money in, in their data centers. Uh, the foundries are also now uh, prepared to, to receive cloud. Uh, they're, they're having requirements, uh, giving those requirements to customers, and they're more open to having these conversations. So it really takes an ecosystem, and I think that ecosystem is forming critical mass and those conversations to, to do something in the cloud can be had. Um, the next one, of course, comes cost, and you know that's, that's always a tricky one, but I, I, I think getting back to the productivity benefits of cloud, that's really where, where a lot of the benefit comes. So cost and security were the two main issues that I saw. So, so as a user of EDA in, in our cloud, right, what, what I find is the biggest problem that I mentioned before is licensing. And so let me give you an example. So one of, our, one of my colleagues uh, went and looked at the current pricing a few days ago, and he says, okay, the kind of the, the standard VM that we'd like to run on costs unit one, and the ones that EDA tools really want to run on are, are, not, are a factor of nine, more, uh, nine times more expensive. So as we all know, the licensing is, you know, it doesn't matter if I'm running on a fast core or on a slow core, you're going to pay the same amount of, of per time. So what I'd really like to see is I'd like to see uh, uh, at least for simulation, for Verilog simulation. I want to see per unit of work done. Let's say gate simulated is the metric. And then whether I run on 10,000 of the cheap uh, machines or 1,000 of the expensive ones, I can actually you know, basically pay the same amount. Right? And so if I can do something like that, I can actually take much better advantage of the cloud and a better advantage of the machines that are in the cloud. Yeah, I actually think that's a a creative idea. I know, uh, you know, Derek and I have discussed this uh, previously. I think one of the other factors that probably needs to, to change as we work towards those models is those machines 
uh, have varying performance levels, and those machines with lower RAM or lower core counts tend to have slower network, for instance, or slower storage. So I think we would also need to work with cloud providers and, and software providers at the same time to make optimized ED instances. I think that's probably where the future will, will go at some point as we, as we gain more critical mass. But I, I think more creative models can be discussed. I just think that there needs to be different dimensions that are, that are looked at, certainly. The one comment I wanted to make about the security of security is partly just perception and education. The old guard IT at the larger semiconductor companies, they have the you know, Fort Knox uh, thing that, you know, if we have the firewall, everything is inside of it, and there is a uh, both perceived and real level of security that you achieve with that. Mm -hmm. And the idea of putting things on the cloud, of course, the cloud can be, you know, either more secure or less secure than a traditional firewall scheme. But the, I think it's a generational issue as well. I think the younger IT uh, generation is actually just more comfortable with the idea of cloud and security in the cloud. And of course, there's you know very very high security standards that can be applied to the cloud as well. So I think those are just more just cultural barriers that need to be overcome as well. Do you think the security thing is um, you know it's about the chip company and the EDA company, or is are there more companies involved? Is it more of an ecosystem thing? I mean, I think it's an ecosystem. You know, I, I'm no longer in touch as well with the security issues myself. You know, and for example, on AWS or Azure or other platforms. Uh, uh, my my sense is it's all all of it actually it's it's all of it uh, combined because mm. every every company can create an opportunity for a vulnerability so every company has to have the lids uh, closed the right way. What about Foundry, IP, anything there? Yeah, a as I mentioned earlier, yeah, the foundries in the past have been hesitant to to allow their IP into the cloud, and today I think is a is a new type of discussion that that the foundries can have with their customers because they have requirements now about what it takes to do that. So I think that's one barrier that has been, that has been passed for a, a lot of these issues. Um, and then in, in terms of you know, just what you mentioned, technology security, I heard it in the panel yesterday, I think it was from, from Derek actually, uh, other Derek down here, it's a, uh, that you know, in, in whichever cloud provider you choose, there's going to be a multitude of, of security technologies that you can pull from at any given time and the basic security principles of semiconductor, you know, access logs, audits, you know, ser secure storage, firewalls, and all of that and more are available at your fingertips in the cloud. So I would argue you can configure the cloud to be more secure uh, if, you, if you utilize those technologies. On, on security, I think Cyrus had it, a, a very good point, is that, that we have, everybody has their security. The Foundry has their security requirements, you know, as an IP provider, ARM has ours. The IT, you know, the, the cloud provider themselves. We're going to have to have a conversation and, and come up with a, a least common denominator at least that says, hey, this is the security platform that, is, that, is, that we can use for design. And that the entire ecosystem represented here are all part of that, that ecosystem and, and security platform definition. Yes, yeah, so. Um, Initially, yeah, we also have the security concern about mm. you know putting our design um, with a, on the cloud and with the EDA vendor. Right? But the, I think the um, through the working with uh, the Cadence uh, HDS VCAT system, I think it, it proves that it's actually more secure than you know we manage ourselves. It basically, it's it's centrally managed and it has a uniform. Um, Kind of standard, right? And uh, uh, everything has to be authorized, and uh, the user, you know, addition, deletion is actually approved by us, even you know, with the um, third-party um, access to it, um, it's all authorized. So I think it's uh, actually more secure than if you know we just manage ourselves. And also, the protection is not just on our own IP, but also on the IP that we purchased from third party vendor, right. you know, like the ARM IP. And the, because it's a, um, centrally managed by you know, the EDA vendor like Cadence, then it's actually provide a better trust by you know, those third par um, party IP vendors. Also. Right. Want a job in marketing, Ronnie? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Oh, That's the true feedback. <laughs> <laughs> I, thank you, I, I think uh, generically speaking, I think 
just having a purpose-built team to look after those, those security. So many internal teams have so many other burdens that there are times you may not have a dedicated you know, IP protection team or, or whoever. So I think you, know, you go to a cloud provider to get the best compute you can for the money. You go to a, a, another vendor to get something else. It's really just all about purpose-built you know, environments. So let's talk for a minute um, about the peak usage side of it, and particularly to this kind of question of sort of, what do you call it, hybrid cloud or, or mixed. So, you know, for the, for the larger chip companies that are out there, maybe they're doing, uh, you know, they've got hundreds of designers that are doing multiple chips a year. So do we think there's, a, you know, the direction really is an all-in model, or we're going to see some kind of blending where a certain amount, if you look at the constant continuous usage, that tries to maintain internally, and then the cloud is really used to offload peak. How do you think that's playing today, and how might that trend? I'll go first because uh, CNIX is a, a good example. You know, it, they didn't invest in a lot of it, so when they become big, they they're not going to need they're they're going to be in a different model. Uh, you, we only have the models we have because that's what we grew up with. Um, right. So I think, in, in fact, I see the biggest challenge is that we need a lot more startups in the chip industry. We need a lot more innovation in the chip industry. The consolidation is good, but, but we're gonna to have to have that innovation. And those, those startups are gonna to have to go where they can get the EDA, the storage, and the, and the compute all with one low price. So, and it's, it's just a new model. You know, we didn't, we didn't realize we, would, we couldn't live without cell phones 10 years ago or, or 12 by now, uh, but, but we'll get used to the model. Do you think it's going, you know, the direction really is an all-in direction, just everything will be on the cloud? I, I think yeah. it's going to be all-in. Uh, right. Over time, the large companies will downsize or they just won't replace their old equipment. Right. Does anyone have a different view? So uh, I think every company has their own sets of requirements, their own sets of, you know, concerns about whether they want to keep things local, whether they want to go into the cloud. And I think... You know, it's great that you guys are, are pushing deep in the cloud, but I, I do know of companies that are a little more concerned. So I think at least at, within Microsoft Azure, we support wh whichever. If you want to stay, you know, completely local and just uh, expand into cloud or you want to be 100% cloud, we're, we're perfectly fine however you want to do that. Um, but I think one of the things that, that's, that's critical is that as, I, I think you're right, that we need more startups, we need more people who are willing to take a bet on, on, on silicon, and I think that's going to grow the EDA market overall. Right, not just having big companies. I think the way that we do things today, we actually favor big companies. So if I'm if I'm a if I'm a large company, I'm Intel, Samsung, I'm ARM. Right, I can say, look, you know, I've got twenty thousand designers, and I've got and they can build their essentially their own cloud, build the licensing, and essentially they're dealing with the, the variations by spreading across their teams. They may tell a team, look, you guys can't start until these guys free up the first set of licenses. Right, the smaller guys can't do that. Right? And so they're, they're kind of stuck with a limited small number of licenses. They, they're, they're kind of throttled in, in how quickly they can move because of that. Yeah, the, so, the ability to multiplex is less and less the, the smaller you are. The yeah. smaller you are. I mean, one, yeah, exactly. one could imagine yeah, having yeah. companies kind of getting together. And this is really the, the promise of the cloud. If we can get EDA, the licensing, the machines, everything into the cloud, now we can, we can enable small guys to be as effective as the big guys. Right. I think that's true, yeah. Because when we started, we don't have a, like a big budget for building our own uh, server farm. So using the cloud, leveraging the computing power, storage system, and networking, everything, I think uh, it really provides a boost for a startup to start building chips. Right, right. Yeah, and then I guess we've got so there's the ability to get more multiplexing, and then there's this somewhat discontinuous point that your actual use model can, be, can change. If you think of right. resources infinite, you can actually start to approach design differently, which is, you know, that applies whether it's a, you know, independent of the company size. Well, and then that, that gets back into trading off time to market for, for concurrent engineering, right? If you, can, if you can get everything kind of going at the same time and get a faster time to market, you're better off. Yeah. Um, I think we see it a lot just on the verification side with these regression suites, you know, that you've got thousands, thousands of jobs and each one is small. I mean, it is very elastic. You can, you can go wider or deeper and you can trade. Um, so it seems like there's some good alignment across the panel there about that, that long-term direction, which is, I think, very exciting. Um, so do you think that, uh, uh, you know, 
there's a prioritization in terms of the EDA industry. If we take the long-term view that everything's going to go cloud, it isn't going to happen overnight. So are there tools that it's more important to move to the cloud first? Uh, is there a particular sort of call to action you might give to the EDA community? You know, focus on this first. I, I can just make a brief comment uh, around, I think as far as the actual CAD software packages, you know, whether it's on the uh, digital side, analog, I think all of those uh, should be, it should be available. And, and our experience has been that almost all the actual software works fine. The, the part that actually doesn't work quite as well has to do with the way you do your data management. You know, before we had, for example, let's say a high performance NFS system or file system of some sort, you had the central repository so that, that model doesn't quite scale the same way. So, you know, whether you're, so we've migrated most of our things to a Git, Git-based solution or GitHub or what have you. So I think those are the aspects that have to be thought through uh, as well, is how is the data repositories, how is the data sharing between these servers that come and go all the time uh, done correctly so that the performance of the, of the application is actually satisfactory? Because you don't want to be... Uh, in a situation where you have a large number of servers, high performance servers at your disposal, but your bottleneck is now the data access to the to the persistent to the disk, data. Right, and right. The storage. So I think those that part of the infrastructure has to be fixed and that has to be fixed for all kinds of reasons because the the, the data configuration management in the semiconductor industry is quite arcane and I don't know why we're not migrating to these more modern systems uh, more quickly. So I think that's one that has to be resolved and then the security, which we've already talked about. So this, so for the, the I mean, this network infrastructure, the disk management and all that, how, how do you see the kind of the ownership and responsibility across the community to, to make that happen? Is that with the cloud? Maybe, maybe there's opportunities for startups to, uh, to, to do this like there is right now with, the, you know, companies like IC Managed Cleosoft and then, the, of course, the big EDA companies can do that as well. Uh, EDA is actually a very diverse uh, thing, as I've learned in my new job, is that it's not just, a, you know, Cadence Synopsis and a handful of others. Uh, there's a very large number of companies, as I guess we see in this, uh, in this uh, conference. So I think there's an opportunity for the data management to be solved as a platform for all CAD tools, regardless of the class of CAD tools. What's, what's your experience on that, Carl, given that you manage the infrastructure for Cadence? Yeah, so you're, you're exactly right. The infrastructure definitely needs to change for cloud. Uh, most groups, if you have a flat uh, farm environment, as, as Derek was mentioning earlier, you're going to have traditional NFS file systems serving it up. Some of them, you'll know I won't name any brands out there, but there's a few common ones in the industry. And in order to migrate to the cloud, you need to think a little bit differently. If you try to do the same approach with software-based NFS servers, you're going to fail you can micro-segment things out, which is actually the approach, I was gonna say, it's actually a combination of, I think, Ron and Derek's approach of treating big companies like a group of small startups and breaking up the work groups so that they have their own optimized environment. Uh, so, so really the answer is initially, you're gonna have to use the technologies that the software support, primarily at NFS. Over time, you'll look at object-based storage and other solutions. There's a lot of storage companies here that I'm sure would love to talk to you about different solutions that they have as well. Generically speaking, at the tool level, Paul, which I think you, you asked earlier, uh, you know, verification, which, which you know a little something about, takes, takes a lot of compute. I think regressions in general are, are a great opportunity if you're a large company to move, to move to the cloud because those seem to take a lot of compute. They seem to be run at certain predictable times. And you know, freeing up some, some cycles from your monolithic farm might help other groups out. And, and farm that out. So that could be one example of something that's easy, you know, characterization, simulation, these are, these are easy, low-hanging fruit, I think, in EDA for tools. Yep, your experiences, Derek, from? Yeah, I mean, so I, I just going to what Carl's saying I mean, and what you've been saying, fundamentally, what cloud is really good at is giving you a lot of resources. So if I've got a million test vectors, but I can put a million cores on them, even right. if the test vector takes ha you know double the time, I'm going to get done in basically the, the the constant time. Constant time, which you know, at least from my perspective, that's a phenomenal win, right? So there's going to be things which are going to require very very fast single threaded performance. Well, frankly, what we do is you know for the, for those kinds of jobs, we have an overclocked machine. You know, it's running at four and a half gigahertz, not something that's readily available in the cloud. Not running, you know, it's overclocked. It's a game machine. So those kinds of applications, you know, may those kinds of workloads may be better suited internally until the cloud catches up. 
right? But I think, right, yeah, right. large parallelism, independent work, that, that falls very nicely in cloud. Yeah, then, then the antagonist comes in and says, but yeah, ultimately there still is a charge for those infinite resources. So one of the things that we're gonna to have to do is look at how we make intelligence. So if you're doing regression, which tests are the ones that are buying you the most bugs? And, and let's, do, let's do machine learning around that. Uh, all the implementation switches of, of SOC routing and things, we need to have a lot of machine learning ability. Now we have all these compute resources up there to do that, but over time we need to use that, that machine learning to lower our cost right. of compute. So I think that's a general optimization for EDA. But in terms of cloud, you know, if, I'm, if I know I have to run those million test vectors, the fact that I can run them in constant time you know, is a fantastic you know, ability. The, the issue is, is licensing, right? Can I get a million licenses? That's, that's, that's the problem. So. You can get a million slots, but not a million licenses. Yeah, you're potentially your, your license hours is constant, but it right. depends on the business model, which has you know, come up from the panelists here. I'm sure Paul can solve that. I think, I think Sounds like licensing is an issue, Derek. I'm listening. I'm to listening. me, whoever, whichever uh, CAD tool vendor solves the licensing first is going to win in cloud. That, that is the fundamental thing. And, and we're all eagerly awaiting some improvements there. You want to make, I'm, I'm moderating the panel, so do you want to make any comments, Carl? Yeah, I think, I think the, uh, the licensing and EDA, I, I heard a lot of discussion on this topic already. So licensing and EDA has been around for quite a long time. And um, different different EDA vendors, I'm speaking generically, of course, not, not taking off my cadence hat. Different EDA vendors have had different approaches, but they're all very similar. I think the race to radically change it is, is probably started, but it's going to take uh, very, very close partnerships with customers to make sure that those models uh, are amicable to both the customer and the EDA provider. And uh, you know, simply changing to a, a radically different model overnight is, is probably not going to happen. But I think as as more companies gain critical mass on the cloud, it, it will eventually it will eventually come to pass. Um, you know, Cadence in particular has different models for for different situations for peak. And you know, if there's a particular peak situation, your your sales or account executive can always have a discussion with you on what's appropriate. Well, then we got to go talk to them. I mean, you guys and, and and other CAD vendors are great. If I call my sales rep and say I need another thousand licenses, they'll they'll actually give them to me, right? You know, this is. But then I got to make the call, right? So, well, w one one shameless plug is we we do have a we do have a portal technology that we can talk to you about with prepackaged. Uh, licensing in there so that that's an option that we can always talk to any of our customers about i think that the, the metering of cad tools is definitely something just like their concept of computing as a utility that you just meter you know you want a computer you just spin it up and you don't have to call anybody you know you want an extra server or an extra thousand servers you spin it up and you just pay for it by the minute or hour or what have you and on the cad side it has to migrate and it will migrate to that and we've seen some very small companies who are quite progressive in that regard uh, uh, and then the same, I think, has to be carried over to the, to the rest of the CAD infrastructure as well. Yeah, the cloud providers can give very accurate metering of each thing that happens in the cloud. So that's, yeah. So it's that, not that a, would be a nice technology problem. problem. <laughs> Microsoft. Not, not, not on the cloud, at least. <laughs> We're off. Hey, how about we uh, attempt to open it up to you guys out here? Um, I feel like we keep talking here all day, but... Uh, Jake Burma. So um, clearly five years ago at DAC, the cloud was not being talked about or maybe in the hallways, maybe a little tiny bit. And now if you can't look around and can't trip over the cloud. You, you can't go in too far. I was everywhere. So there was a tipping point in the last five years. Now, clearly Amazon, uh, Google, and Microsoft were part of that tipping point. When did that happen? And is there another tipping point coming up, maybe licensing being that tipping point? So in the next five years, what's the big tipping point with cloud-based CDA? Is it licensing or is there something more than that? Yeah, I mean, I can, I can maybe attempt to, to give an answer and then anyone else can jump in. So I think uh, I mentioned a little bit before there were conversations with cloud providers happening five, six years ago. And they didn't really have the vertical specialists that understood how to get companies to the cloud. And over the last five years, I think we're here because many companies have asked for it and, and it's there. 
I think the next sort of tipping point for, for EDA is, is probably going to be a combination of licensing models, you know, technologies that optimize the designs like machine learning, AI, and it's really going to be a combination of things that, that the, the designs are getting so complex, I can just tell you that moving down to the next process node you know, probably, probably takes 20, 30% more you know, compute just for that same process that you ran last year on a, on a different node. And that's just not sustainable. My budget doesn't increase 20%. I don't think anyone's budget increases 20% each year. So I think it's physics is going gonna, is gonna to determine the next, uh, the next tipping point. Yeah. Good. Anyone else? Oh, yes. Um, so here's a question. Um, everyone talks about licensing as the um, mixed barrier. Everyone focuses on the EDA vendors for that. Um, there's two parts of licensing. There's what the EDA vendors provide, and there's the, um, the, the semiconductor houses consuming it. Traditionally, semiconductor houses have not been willing to disclose what they run, when they run, and the amounts of jobs they run. For the cloud to work and for the licensing models to work effectively, that's going to have to change. They're going to have to disclose to the EDA vendors what they're running and when they're running it. Is, do you think the semi-houses are willing to make that change? So it, that really depends on how you do the licensing, right? So let's say that you buy credits. You buy you know, a million credits, and a credit is equal to a certain amount of work on each one of the tools. Then you know, the, you know, the, the, the EDA company is going to know, well, the company bought a million credits, but could be all in, in simulation, could be all in place and route, could be all, we don't know, right? So I think there's ways to abstract, abstract that, and the cloud provider can provide that abstraction to, to maintain the secrecy. I mean, obviously, the, the EDA companies know how many licenses are being bought, so. I, I actually think that's an interesting question. Um, we, we found that there's a lot of secret, uh, you know, just a lot of confidentiality around the designs, especially when you're talking about an IP <laughs> provider, right? You're competing with companies, and if, if your IP gets out, you're going to lose your competitive advantage. So, you know, giving the EDA vendor statistics about the design might give away information you wouldn't want divulged. And I think, to, to Rich's point, uh, who asked the question, I think that will be a necessity as we go down looking to change the licensing models because... Otherwise, how would you know how to price these things if you don't know the aspects of, of your designs? Right? Hi, I'm Mike Johnson. Mike. Um, <laughs> so I understand the whole hybrid cloud conversation, right? The idea to be able to burst to the cloud for peak workload. How are you dealing with the management that is on-prem and then all of a sudden now it needs to be accessible from the cloud or actually in the cloud um, and then bringing that data back or long-term retention in the cloud because cloud storage is typically more expensive um, for the performance tiers that you're talking about. How are you managing data movement? That seems like a big challenge to me. Good, good, good point, yeah. Um, so from our side, you know, we have certain uh, procedure, like, uh, you know, there are only uh, certain... Um, Managers have the privilege to take you know the data out, and it has to be authorized. And uh, for the third-party like a uh, IP library, normally we it's like we only um, send it into the cloud. You know, uh, we basically without authorization, no one can like take it out. So there is a certain authorization procedure, and uh, we found it uh, quite you know, working. Well, yeah. But I think uh, in terms of how to utilize the resource in the cloud, I think, uh, um, you know, we actually tested uh, our workload on the Azure um, data center. And uh, I think the best way is probably um, to utilize the um, computing resource, um, storage you know, um, resource as a, as a utility pool, but are still managed and front-ended by you know, the EDA uh, to vendor so that they can uh, actually give the uh, licensing uh, in terms of what's your uh, peak usage, what's the average usage, and uh, in terms of the uh, negotiation part, yeah. So one of the things that we're doing, uh, we do the storage the same way. We, we kind of install the libraries there, and they stay permanent, and we, we just send the rest of the design up, work on it, and bring it back. 
Uh, the other thing that we've had to do at ARM is that we had to create a load balancer because we're using it for peak. Then if we get full, then we say, okay, what jobs can we send? So we have to have our own kind of uh, dispatcher LFS you know, equivalent. And, uh, and you know, if we were starting, if we were totally cloud, we, we could get eliminate that. But, but right now, when you, that's one of the downsides right. of peak is you have to have your own uh, kind of queuing system. So Azure has this thing called Azure Stack, which effectively, when you run it on your on-prem facility, it looks like you're running in Azure. So you can basically just build everything as if you're running in Azure, run entirely at home, and then only when you peak, it'll, it'll automatically go and, and spool you up. There's solutions coming. <laughs> or there. That's actually released. <laughs> solutions released. You know, about four years ago, we did emulation off-site, uh, cloud-based emulation, if that's the word or what have you. And uh, the, the, getting the data in and out was remarkably easy. It was a hack, I'd say, is how we sent the data and the design database and picked up the results. But that's an area that is part of the entire data management and configuration management needs to be addressed. And maybe the cloud solutions can be part of it, where the entire picture is cloud-based, regardless of whether your hardware is in-house or um, at the co-location facility. Having that uniform environment is very useful. Otherwise, you know, your scripts have to account for where you're running and all that. Yeah, yeah and, and maybe just to put a finer point, uh, if you have a traditional data center and, and you have a cloud environment, you need to make the cloud environment to look like an extension of your network and you would transfer files to that environment just like you would any other location. It's gonna require script modifications. It's gonna require making sure you're smart about if you're performing regressions, don't send all the tests, don't send all the results back, just send the failures back and fix those, you know, and, and you'll have to manage your data so that uh, you don't pay the, uh, the, the egress costs of cloud providers because that, that's where they get you. Is, it's like the Roach Motel, you can't move data out, but you can move it in. <laughs> Sorry, Derek. Very nice. I sense another business model uh, <laughs> change requirement there. Did that, Michael? Did that answer your question? I, close enough. There's, there's unfortunately no out of the box solution that I've seen that that does it for you. You're going to have to modify scripts and, and know where your data is. I think I picked up some element there though as well about different tiers of disk performance have different costs and how do you optimize your kind of job orchestration around that variable. Was that part of your question? High performance. Typically, these jobs are going to run on high performance flash today, right? right. And, um, but what, 60 to 80% of EDA data is cold, right. right? And so, and cloud storage at that tier is m more expensive than on-prem, that there's no question about that, right? And so there's a big challenge of how do you manage that? Um, and then, you know, just how do you manage moving data back and forth and the egress costs, yeah. blah, 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 blah. There's, data is a big challenge, particularly when you're looking at the, uh, the physical tape out size designs where you're talking about half a petabyte of data potentially, yeah. right? Um, so, anyway. Yeah, j just the data explosion part, there, there are very uh, purpose-built purpose tools out there that can actually move data based on age. And that's actually what we do in, inside of Cadence for engineers, and they don't even know it half the time. <laughs> Thank goodness, or else they ask me for the most expensive storage. We, we, move, we move storage to a cold tier of storage in, an, in a cloud provider, actually, and it is cheaper than what we can do on-prem. And um, there are technologies out there that, uh, if you'd like, we can talk offline after. I just don't want to market, market any particular products. <laughs> how, much t how much time do we have left? One more question. Put someone on the hot spot. Yay. Um, are EDA vendors um, committed to providing access to their tools across all the data center providers? Because as a potential customer, you might want to optimize what you're paying on the back end for compute storage by moving between different vendors. Are you referring to public cloud providers or just? However the market develops. Yeah, we, we go with, uh, at least speaking for Cades, we go with customer demand. So if there's a high demand for you know, Microsoft, we're going to make sure we support our offerings on Microsoft and so on and so forth. If a customer comes to us and says we want to run on a cloud, we'll, we'll entertain those discussions and just make sure that that provider has the right security measures to, uh, 
to, to handle not only our licensing and, and IP, but the customer's IP as well. So we want to make sure it's, a, again, a partnership discussion, and it's done with, with the customer security in mind. You're the only EDA vendor yeah. on the panel, so. Yeah. <laughs> that, uh, that answer. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a great question, yeah. Yeah, um, but, yeah today, today we, you know, Caden supports all three for, for our cloud-ready tools. Do you, you guys hear that? Maybe okay, the customers yeah. want to comment on what, what they see their future being if they did find a situation where they would want to move to a different vendor, and would that be It's pretty easy. easy if, a, if a CAD vendor doesn't let me do what I want, I'm not going to use that CAD vendor. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, we, we have tested on the Azure at the same time. Uh, it, um, we are starting to try it out, basically, and see how that works and uh, by utilizing you know, the more computing um, resource there, basically. I don't need my CAD tools to run on anything but Azure, so. <laughs> <laughs> this might be the wrong panel for that question. Ron, you want to wrap us up? Yeah, well, you know, we, are, we are doing uh, two cloud, Azure and uh, AWS, and so, so far the EDA has supported us really, really well, so uh, we're, we're pleased with the, uh, with the support so far. So thank you all for taking the time and thank you again to the panelists. Really appreciate you doing the panel today.